So first of all, would you mind just quickly saying a little bit about yourself, Omar, your background, the city of Houston, and then I'll start asking the questions. Well, first, Phil, let me thank you in, uh, for inviting me here and also Bloomberg for having me here today. Um, I, I appreciate this opportunity to come talk about the story of the city of Houston. Uh, I am uh, the HR director for the city of Houston. I've been there now a little over five years. Um, my responsibility includes all HR functions uh, for the city of Houston, which means we have about 22,000 employees, right. uh, about 60,000 people on our health benefits plan. I run uh, safety and workers comp. I run uh, uh, employee relations and labor relations, training and development, um, HR operations, which is what we're going to talk about from the shared services model, and then I also run compensation. So full suite of HR uh, are under my control in the city of Houston. I'm going to, I've got some questions down here and I'm just going to go with it. Um, HR operations, you talk about, and actually what, what I've learned from reading your case study and talking to you is a lot of your HR transformation at the city of Houston has been actually strategically focused. So it's been an, about enabling the business partnering side of the business and using HR operations to provide the platform and savings to achieve that. Is, is that a correct statement? Would you yeah, add so, to that? What, um, what was the main drivers for, for shared services or well, operational efficiencies? I think when I, when I got to the city five years ago, I come from the private sector very much as you talk about. I spent 26 years at UPS, 24 of them in management. Most of my time was spent in operations. So right. I come with a operational mindset. Uh, when I came into the city of Houston, we had some serious financial challenges, about a uh, 50 to $70 million budget deficit our first year that the uh, new mayor had taken over. Um, the new mayor also, um, when she was um, giving her acceptance speech, said that there were two things that were unsustainable in the city of Houston. One was pension, one was health care. And so we had this burning platform that we had to try to look for savings immediately. And one of the places that we saw opportunity was in HR operations and through some consolidation. We had a decentralized model, and one of the things that we said we wanted to move to was a more centralized model of HR. Um, we had some problems with uh, liability to the city because right. of the model that we were operating, inefficiencies um, that we were seeing across organizations because of non-standardized practices. So there were a lot of things that led us to recognize that we needed to move to this more uh, HR shared services model. So, so you came into an organization um, that was set in its ways, uh, long tenured employees. So how did you move forward with actually persuading people to change? Because that's tr change management is this term we hear a lot about. And in the higher education public sector, it's obviously phenomenally important. And it doesn't just mean sending out emails on a Friday afternoon. So what was it that you guys did to start the process of getting buy-in and persuading people, even those who didn't want to do it, because there's always people who don't want to do it? How do you do that? Well, let me just say, when you start talking about change, let me just talk about the environment that I Absolutely. walked into, because I think I walked into a very transactional organization, and the long-term goal was to be transformational. Um, I walked into a analog technology um, that we were using and the goal, you know, everybody else was in a digital world. And when I talk about analog technology, I'll just tell you in 2010 in the city of Houston, we were still using typewriters and carbon paper to do some of our, to do all of our personnel actions. And so one day um, I walked into the office and there was a stack literally this high sitting there. And yeah. I said, what is that? And they said, those are the, uh, personnel actions that you need to sign and make sure you press hard because you got to get through all five copies. So I was just like, are we serious with this? So um, very much uh, an organization in need of change. And so how did we start that change? One of the first things that you have to do if you're going to start talking about change is you have to be transparent in where you're trying to go and the vision that you're trying to communicate to those in the organization. Right. So what I did was I started listening to our stakeholders which would have been the other departments that we service. And I had to find out what their needs were, what were the things that they were looking for from the HR department. And what I kept hearing over and over is, we want someone who will partner with us, not tell us what the rules are. Um, we know our business. We want to be successful. And what I had to do was start talking 
to our internal employees about how do we make the department successful that we service and not so much focus on HR rules and HR processes. And so we started this whole transparent trust type of conversation with our employees internally. I opened the door to my office. I said, I want to have an open door policy. Anybody got any question? I started having town hall meetings. It was a lot of listening, a lot more than me going out talking about what I wanted to do. After I had internalized what the message was, then we were able to start looking at a path that we were going to take. So on the employees specifically, how did you assess the nature of your employee base in terms of skill set, because one of the things you did was sort of try and reallocate people into different roles, reallocate, um, fit people with, in discussion into different roles. How did you do that? Because again, there's a change element to that. Was, what was the process So, there? So if I, if I had to be honest with you, one of the things that I would have done sooner and faster was try to baseline where everybody's skill set was, because I think one of the keys to success in this transformation or in any type of transformation is um, getting the right people in the right seats on the right. bus. And I think it has taken us longer to get that done than I initially would have liked to. So I think the ability to baseline. But one of the things that we said as we were talking about the transformation to those that were going to be impacted because literally nobody was for the transformation and nobody right. was for the centralization that we were going to do um, was I looked at where people's, the services that people were receiving and I said, look, if you're receiving a high level of a service, um, we will make sure that we maintain that level of service. If you're receiving a lower level of service, our goal is to move it up and continuously improve upon the service that you're receiving. Um, and so we just kept looking and we started doing surveys, we started doing uh, assessments of our people to see where their skill sets were, but I think we probably should have put some more emphasis early on in bringing up those skill sets because five years into it we're still doing baselining and making sure that we can get the skill sets where we need them to be. Yeah, I, I understand that. It's, it's, it, one of the tricks is always saying what would you have done differently, but hindsight's a wonderful thing. I mean, I imagine at the time maybe you, you had other, um, other priorities but uh, to, to move things forward. Well, yeah, and, and certainly this was a the, the burning platform that we yeah. had was health benefits, and you know we certainly were looking at about a 10% per year growth, and we were spending about $300 million per year, and certainly that was unsustainable. And so that was really my main focus. This was a secondary focus, but certainly an important thing that we had to get accomplished during this administration. And actually the million dollar question, or the whatever it was dollar question, <laughs> what, looking back over those five years, what have you achieved in terms of well, actually both, savings in terms of hard dollars, but also process efficiency improvements and the model, the operating model. You, you did some things around strategic partnerships. So what are the benefits that you've actually realized from doing this over the last well, Thanks for asking that question. Uh, certainly when we started off um, and looking at what the centralization was going to look at, we looked at many different models. And the one that we ultimately settled on was the business partner model where we left people embedded inside of the organizations um, to continue to provide services to those organizations. When we started looking at the numbers, which is what you asked me about, the numbers were sort of uh, staggering. Um, we had one HR person for every 38 city employees. So the ratio of one for 38 was obviously one that we knew was unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, at UPS, our ratio was more like one for 100. Um, after uh, reduction in force, after some other uh, reallocation of workforce, the number today is one for 119. So um, one to 38 to one for 119 a day, which we think is a more acceptable number, but we know that our people are extremely busy, so we may need to try to bring that number down some. So if you talk about the numbers from a cost perspective, um, if you say the average city employee makes 45,000 $48,000 a year. You go from 119, um, um, one for 38, which is about 500 and some odd people, to one for 30, uh, 119, mm -hmm. which is about 174 people. Um, somewhere in the range of cost avoidance, 13, 15 million dollars cost avoidance per year is a number that you could roughly estimate. Um, I don't want to say that's a hard dollar term because some of those persons were reallocated to other places right. inside of the organization, but certainly we're looking at some substantial cost savings back to the organization by switching to this business partner model. 
Were you, one of the tricky questions, especially in the public sector, and I, uh, is were you able to actually, you said reallocate employees. Did you let anyone go? Were there any redu are rifts, reductions in force? So yes, so the first year um, when we had the 50 to $70 million budget deficit, we did have a reduction in force of about 670 people as citywide. So some of that right. was impacted to HR, but obviously we wouldn't be able to get that type of cost uh, savings from reducing HR staffing, but certainly there was some impact to HR staffing during that initial first year where we had the um, 50 to $70 million budget deficit. I know, just one other thought. Well, I'm, on the benchmarking side, you mentioned the, your, you know, your previous private sector experience and the ratio, HR ratios. One thing I've experienced, uh, not just in the public sector, but in just about every organization I've ever been in is the statement, that doesn't apply here, we're unique. Um, did you face that? I'm sure you did. And how did you address that? Well, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that I tried to get, you, you were absolutely faced that where people say that doesn't apply here. We're unique. This is the government. Um, we, we're not a business. We're not yeah. in the, uh, we're, we're not in the service of providing these types of, or we're not in a profit making mode. And so when we started talking about how did we overcome that obstacle, it was by communication. So mm. there's a standard, regardless if you are in the government, if you're in higher education, if you're in the private sector, by which all organizations need to operate to be efficiency, to be efficient. And so we started talking more about efficiencies mm -hmm. and those things as opposed to benchmarking ourselves against private industry. But it all goes back to that transparent trust and communication that we tried to portray to uh, or tried to display as we were going through this transformational process. I know we have another speaker later on. I think you may maybe even touch on this, but transparency, um, very, very important. Mm -hmm. But there's also a saying that I use sometimes, communicate with confidence. So you can be transparent at the wrong time. So if you, if you stand up in front of somebody in a group and you say something you're not completely confident in, you can actually make do more harm than good. So how did your communications transparency, do you have a plan? Um, how did that work? Was it rolled out at the senior levels? I mean, just a bit more. So, so yes, I think we, we started at the executive level. So we started with communications to the executive levels, letting them know what the plan was as we were going to be moving forward. Because obviously, without their support and their buy in, yeah. there is no chance for success. So when you start with that executive level, and then you make sure that you keep the message consistent, yes. and you communicate it often, yes. and, and you stay on message. You know, I, I, I like that we are in DC because this is the place, no matter what question you're asked, you answer what you want to ask. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> you answer what yeah. you want to answer no matter what you're asked is what yeah. I'm trying to say. So yeah, I understand, um, yeah. as, as opposed to making sure that you are answering the question that is actually asked. So we were very disciplined in our message That's and we key. formulated our message early based on the milestones that we wanted to hit and the targets that we were trying to achieve. So there was no deviation as we were moving forward um, because the message had already been set. And then as the leader of the transformation, I always made sure that I was out front right. leading that message and making sure that those persons who supported me were able to carry the same message out. So a lot of internal dialogue to make sure that the external message was communicated correctly. Right. And I talk, we talk about uh, change management again, but barriers, barriers, unique, unique barriers. There are every organization, be it public sector or government or private sector or higher education, always has something unique about it, it's for true. What was unique about the city of Houston that you had to address and how did you do that? Well, I think one of the unique things about government higher education is something that governments, I mean, higher education certainly faces its tenure, and we face in uh, the public sector is something called civil service rules. Right. And those rules do not allow you to change and be as agile and flexible as you might be able to be in the private sector. So a lot of barriers were people in wrong positions, so we had to formulate a strategy to make sure that we were able to keep people in the same job classification, for instance, to make sure that their pay didn't change and those types of things. Otherwise, there was opportunities for them to file grievances and those types of things. So I think there was a lot of early planning that took place to make sure that we were able to achieve the ultimate 
goal, but you know, when you have to work with a workforce that you can't, uh, w which limits the flexibility mm -hmm. of what you can do, you've got to be creative and you've mm -hmm. got to make sure that you know you're working on those person's skill sets as you move forward because some people you just are going to have to keep no matter what and you have to find the role that best fit their skill set mm -hmm. as you were looking at what you're trying to mm -hmm. accomplish. And uh, just thinking about how much was, I mean, the big, another big question is technology, right? I mean, one of the data points I've seen in benchmarking in general is there isn't a problem with spend on technology in higher education. It's a problem of use of spend of technology in higher education. So if you benchmark against the private sector, a lot of money is spent on technology. It's just not necessarily efficiently spent. In, in your experience, did you spend much on technology? How, how important was technology? You talked about the typewriters and the carbon copies. I know you did use technology in your ERP. So can you just talk a little bit about the yeah, technology so, side so of it? Yeah, we, um, so we, we've not spent a lot on technology, but I think we've become more efficient in our use of technology. I'll just give you a quick example. Um, I talked about the typewriters. Well, now in 2015, we're using cloud technology, mm -hmm. which would have been unheard of but because of our partnership with our IT group, we've been able to leverage the cloud technology that we already had purchased right. and utilize it more. We were using about 30% of our human capital management module in SAP. Now we're up to about 90% leveraging what was already in place. You actually dropped a, another technology, if I remember, which saved you a lot of money, right? Oh, yes. That well, was... absolutely. So we were using a third-party platform right. to do our open enrollment. Um, that third-party platform was costing me about $650,000 right. a year. Um, we brought it internal, and we've saved $650,000 a year perpetually as we move forward because we're using internal technology just to do open enrollment. So that's a concrete savings that we're able to quantify immediately because we're not paying $650,000 to that third-party vendor. And just while I'm on the subject of benefits, there are a couple of other benefits I remember you talking about. For example, use of flexible labor force, and you were able to move, was it contractors at peak times? Yeah, or was so, it the forestry area? So absolutely, that Parks Department, one of the Parks. things that you're talking about was when we had the decentralized model, because of the rapid increase that they would have to make for summer employment, pools, grass, and those types of things, they would have to augment the staff with temporary staff to bring in uh, those employees in a very short period of time. Because we now have this centralized model, um, we are able to flex our workforce depending on where that need is. So for instance, in the summertime, we're able to take people from another cluster and move them over there to help get those people brought on. And that reduces the need for temporary staffing that we might have had in the past as a city. So the model, mm -hmm. the ability to flex, the ability to be agile as an organization are all things, the ability to use technology more, are all things that have worked in our favor as we've implemented this shared services model. And, and you mentioned surveying your customers, et cetera. How, what's your customers say about it now? If, if, um, I, if I had you, one of your two or your three of your customers here on, on the floor with us, well, what would they say about I, I think about we do annual customer, customer surveys, and so we get those surveys back. Um, we're getting 80% favorable ratings right now from our customers. You know, you have those outliers for people who mm. want to go back to the past who keep thinking, you know, Omar's going to go away one day yeah, and we're yeah. going to go back to yeah. the old model. But I think <laughs> it's too late to unring that bell. Yeah. Um, the way that we have uh, consolidated things, it would take an expansion of the workforce, and I just don't see that happening anytime mm. soon. So 80% um, favorability. Um, is pretty good if mm. you look at the overall standings mm. of our customer satisfaction uh, ratings. Obviously a great story. I, mean, I know we're coming to the end of our session here, but what next, both for the City of Houston HR and for you personally in the organization? So what, what's your challenge? What are you doing next? I think we continue to look at innovation and agility as a city, and I know those are words that normally you don't think about when you start talking about a government sector, mm -hmm. but every year I have two words that will define the upcoming year. And in 2016, those two words are innovation and agility. I take my team through innovation training. And so we're going to continue to try to be innovative as a city. What's next for Omar personally is to continue to partner with people like you and Bloomberg doing these types of discussions around the country. Well, thank you very much, Omar. Hopefully you, you, you can all see what a great story that is. And 
There is actually a case study that uh, we co-wrote with Omar, which I don't even know if it's available in here. It is. Um, and of course, Omar, are you going to be hanging around for a little while? I will be here and look forward to talking to anybody who anybody, wants to talk with me. Anybody, any questions, please come and talk to Omar. So, so say thank you very much to Omar. Thank you. Thank you.